Okay, so in this video we're going to talk about the visual system. Now, the receptors for vision, or basically sight, are located on the posterior part of the eyeball. And these receptors we find in the eye are specifically photoreceptors. Now, as photoreceptors, they're capable of detecting things like light, specific types of light, such as different colors, and even movement in the visual field. Now, there are lots of accessory structures of the eye that, that have different functions and protection and support, and we'll talk about that in the next coming slides. So some of the external accessory structures of the eye include things like eyebrows, eyelashes, eyelids, tarsal glands, and the eyebrows are involved with uh, preventing sweat from entering your eye. Eyelashes are involved with helping to prevent you know, foreign objects from hitting your eyeball. And the eyelids are involved with helping to wash debris um, across the surface of your eye. Now, on the inside of your eyelid, there are something called tarsal glands, which are located on the uh, sort of the inner side of each eyelid. These are specialized sebaceous glands, so they're oil glands, that prevent tear overflow, and they also prevent the eyelids from sticking together. So that this modified secretion by these tarsal glands, it's made of basically a sebaceous secretion, it helps protect the outside of the eye. Now another, another structure that helps support the eyeball is something called conjunctiva. Now what this picture is showing is a little bit of conjunctiva. And what it is is basically a stratified squamous epithelium that lines the white of the eye. It goes back and then also connects to the eyelid. What this basically forms is a protective sheath that prevents debris from getting back behind the eyeball because this tissue, conjunctiva, goes back and then curves around and connects to the eyelid. So that if debris did get, you know, sort of underneath the eyelid, it would have trouble getting back behind the eyeball because there would be a conjunctiva there to basically help prevent that from going any more posteriorly. Now this conjunctiva does contain goblet cells, which are basically mucus cells, which help lubricate and moisten the eye. That way when the eyeball moves around in the socket, it's well lubricated and can move sort of cleanly and fluidly. Now some other external structures we can see, well, you know, we got eyebrows and eyelashes. We also have the palpebra. Basically palpebra is just your eyelid. And the space between the two eyelids is called the palpebral fissure. Now, um, in this palpebral fissure, we can see part of the eyeball. Now, the parts of the eyeball that are visible sort of externally would be things like the sclera, which is the white of your eye. Sclera literally means scar, and because um, it looks like kind of like scar tissue. That's the sclera, a white of the eye. Now, we can also see the iris, which is the pigmented part of your eye, which we'll, we'll come back to in a little bit. But basically, the iris controls an opening there in the center of your eye called the pupil. And the pupil is not really a thing. It's just more of a space in the iris that can change size when the iris, iris contracts in uh, different ways. So the pupil can, can basically dilate or enlarge or constrict or shrink uh, based on the activities of the um, iris. Now, on the medial part, of the eye, we see some structures that are involved with your tear system, which is called the lacrimal system. Now, this sort of indentation here is called the lacrimal caruncle, and within this sort of lacrimal caruncle, we have what are called lacrimal puncta on either side, which allow tears to drain through the nasal lacrimal duct into the nose and beyond, which we'll get to here in a little bit. Now, if we look at a cut through the eyeball, we can see there's a lot of structures that support the outside of the eyeball. Um, for one, we have some extrinsic eye muscles like the superior rectus and the inferior rectus. We have the inferior oblique and some other eye muscles that we can't see from this view, but we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, there's another interesting muscle that's nearby, and this one actually connects not to the eyeball, but the eyelid. This one's called levator palpebrae superioris, and it's involved in elevating the upper eyelid. Now you can also see some orbicularis oculi muscle nearby, which we talked about in AMP1. And um, if you just look at the eyeball itself, you can see that it's actually, it's mostly kind of an empty space. Now, 
it's not really empty in the truest sense, but rather it's less dense and it's actually more of these large fluid filled spaces deep in the eyeball. Now, um, outside of the eye, we see that there's actually what's called orbital fat or adipose, which again helps insulate and protect the eyeball. And a lot of it's more posterior than the eyeball. And this orbital fat relates to different diseases, which we'll talk about in uh, future classes. Now, if you look at the general structure of the eye, there's lots of different layers here. So we have some outer layers and some inner layers, and we have two chambers that are separated by the lens here. And these chambers are filled with different fluids. So over here we have the anterior chamber, which is filled with aqueous humor. We have the posterior chamber, which is filled with vitreous humor. Now, in the very posterior part of the eyeball, lining the inside of the posterior chamber, this is all the retina. Now the retina contains your photoreceptor cells, which have axons that continue back towards the optic nerve, which goes to the optic tract, and then that goes back towards your brain. Now, we, earlier I mentioned how there was a tear system, which we call the lacrimal system. Now, the lacrimal fluid are basically tears, and it's created by a lacrimal gland, which is located on the lateral part of the eyeball. Now, the function of tears is they help lubricate the anterior surface of the eye, but tears also contain antibiotic-like enzyme, which is called lysozyme, which essentially helps break down bacterial cell walls and prevents bacterial infection of your eyeball. You know, think about the eyeball. It's a very hospitable environment for bacteria. You know, it's moist, it's warm, uh, it can receive a lot of nutrients from tears. So it's very prone to being infected with bacteria. However, there are antibiotic-like secretions in tears that prevent um, infection. Now, what's interesting about the lacrimal apparatus is that while tears are made by the lacrimal gland, which is located in the lateral aspect of the eyeball, the lacrimal gland has little ducts that help drain tears or lacrimal secretions onto the anterior surface of the eyeball, whereby those tears then can wash across the surface of the eyeball towards the lacrimal caruncle, where it can drain through lacrimal puncta through the lacrimal ducts or canaliculi into the nasolacrimal duct and into the nose. Now what's interesting is this lacrimal apparatus is always active to some degree. Even if you're not crying, your lacrimal gland is still making tears to some extent because your eyeball needs to be lubricated and you know basically to help prevent bacterial infections. So there's always tears washing over the surface of your eyeball to some degree. Now they always move in this direction unless you're creating a lot of tears, they'll run down you know, the cheek or something. Otherwise, tears are actually washed over, over the surface of the eye through the action of blinking. They drain into the lacrimal canaliculi through a suction action because this lacrimal sac right here, it will actually kind of pinch every time you blink. And when it opens back up, it creates a vacuum which can suck tears up through the lacrimal sac and then down into the nasal lacrimal duct. In fact, this functions a lot like an eyedropper where you're actually creating a vacuum suction to move fluid into a tube. Now this nasal lacrimal duct drains into the nasal cavity. This is one of the reasons why you know, your nose can get runny if you're crying because tears will drain into the nasal cavity through this nasal lacrimal duct. Now if this gets plugged, uh, which can happen commonly through inflammation and infection, or through congenital malformations, uh, these lac nasal lacrimal ducts and canaliculi can be sort of cleaned out with uh, sort of a needle-like probe to help remove any kind of, kind of debris that might be blocking these ducts. Now, what we're going to do next for the rest, part, the rest of this lecture is basically talk about the um, internal structure of the eye and the functions of these different internal structures. Now, what's nice is that we can break down the eye structure into three main layers or tunics. We have a fibrous tunic, a vascular tunic, and the retina. And these really kind of go from superficial to deep. Now, in the fibrous tunic of your eye, this is made up of things like your sclera, which is the white of the eye, as well as your cornea, which is the clear anterior part of the eyeball. Now, the vascular tunic is located even deeper in the eyeball. And this is, this is actually comprised of things like your iris, which is a piece of pigmented smooth muscle that controls the size of the pupil. It's also um, 
it comp uh, has the ciliary body here, which is some smooth muscle that helps control the shape of the lens and creates aqueous humor for the anterior chamber of the eye. And it also involves something called choroid. Now choroid is a vascular layer which is has a lot of blood vessels. Now the function of choroid is it has so many blood vessels that it helps nourish the retina, which requires a lot of nutrients, but it also helps keep the inside of the eyeball cool. And that sounds kind of weird because typically we think about blood flow as warming up tissues. However, with the choroid, it helps cool down the inside of the eyeball because as light gets focused through the lens into the back of the eye, heat can start to build up in the eyeball. Now with all the blood flowing through choroid, the blood can help absorb some of that heat and help take it away from the eyeball, thus cooling down the inside of the eyeball and preventing sort of overheating, if that makes sense. Now that's called the choroid layer, which has a lot of blood vessels. So it's involved in nourishing the retina and also cooling down the eyeball. Now the retina itself is the internal lining of the eyeball in the posterior cavity which has a pigmented layer and a neural layer. The pigmented layer is here, has a lot of melanocytes which are involved in absorbing light and preventing too much scattering of light. And then we have a neural layer which has neurons and photoreceptor cells that can help sense light. Now in terms of the fibrous tunic, we talked about how we have the cornea and sclera. Remember cornea was the clear, transparent anterior part of the eyeball. And the sclera was the white, sort of the white part of the eye that helps serves as the attachment point for different muscles and helps su uh, supply some more structure to the eyeball itself. Now, uh, in terms of the vascular tunic, we had the choroid, the ciliary body, and iris. Remember, the choroid has all of your uh, blood vessels, which can help nourish the retina and help cool down the eye. And the ciliary body has ciliary muscles, which help control the shape of the lens and ciliary processes which help create aqueous humor for um, flow of fluid in the anterior chamber of the eyeball, as well as the iris, which is the pigmented part that controls the size of the pupil. And ultimately this helps control the amount of light that's able to enter your eyeball. Now looking at the that same kind of cross-section again, we can see that there's a lot of finer detail here in the eyeball. Um, now remember the posterior chamber is filled with vitreous humor and the anterior chamber is filled with aqueous humor. Now what separates the posterior and anterior chambers ultimately is the lens. So the lens really serves as the dividing line between the anterior and posterior chambers. Now this posterior chamber is full of vitreous humor and the anterior chamber is full of aqueous humor. And um, the vitreous humor is kind of like a gelatinous substance that really is supporting and um, keeps the eyeball uh, more round. The aqueous humor is a nourishing sort of fluid that's made here by the ciliary body and that actually goes up and enters the anterior cavity which can help nourish structures like the iris and the cornea. Now uh, we talked about how the iris is involved with controlling the size of the pupil and when we talk about pupil size, we talk about constriction and dilation. If the pupil is more constricted, that means it's smaller and there's less light that's able to pass through. If the pupil is dilated, that means it's larger and there's more light that's able to pass through. Now, constricted pupils are associated with things like bright light, as well as increased parasympathetic activity, and dilated pupils are associated with things like low light and increased sympathetic activity. Now if you think about it from the standpoint of light levels, it would make sense how if it's really bright outside, you'd want your pupil more constricted to let less light in. That way things don't appear to be too bright and the image can still see, seem kind of clear. And if you think about it, if it's very dark out or dim out, how you'd want to have as much light enter your eyeball as possible. That way you can see the image out in front of you um, as clearly and as sort of uh, detailed as possible, sort of in low light conditions. So you want to let the most light in. Now, remember the retina has two layers. We have the pigmented layer and the neural layer. The pigmented layer 
has lots of melanocytes that are involved in absorbing some of that light. Now this pigmented layer prevents scattering of light inside the eyeball, which helps keep the image more clear. And the neural layer houses the photoreceptor cells, which are involved in picking up photons or packets of light for um, basically transduction of that information towards the brain. Now, um, the pigmented layer also provides photoreceptors with vitamin A. Um, vitamin A is uh, basically beta-carotene, which you find in carrots. And it turns out that it's actually um, uh, sort of a myth that carrots improve your vision. Vision, Although carrots do contain a lot of beta-carotene and vitamin A, you know, excessive amounts of vitamin A won't make you see better. And it turns out that the myth behind this whole vitamin A thing came from World War II when the Allied forces first invented radar. They wanted to throw the enemies off track by telling or spreading the rumor that their pilots were eating up a lot of carrots. That, that way they can see things in the distance better. But it had, had to do with actually radar, nothing to do with carrots. But that myth is still sort of perpetuated in our society. Um, <clears throat> now this neural layer, though, remember, has the photoreceptor cells which you have rods and cones, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. We can see these layers in this slide, a cross-section, where we have our pigmented layer and our neural layer. Now, um, the neural layer has your photoreceptor cells, pigmented layer has uh, melanocytes to absorb light. You know, we have our choroid and our sclera. So you can see that the wall of the eyeball is actually fairly thin, but it does have some sort of finer detail, it's important to note, in these layers. Now, one thing that's important to note, too, is that if you look back on the retina, we see that there's a part of the retina where there's all these blood vessels and nerve that's basically entering and exiting the eyeball. We call this part the optic disc, and this is essentially the blind spot of our eyeball. Um, at, at the optic disc, this is a place where you can't fit any photoreceptor cells because there's so many nerve fibers and blood vessels. So this, this is essentially a blind spot in our eyeball. Um, usually we don't see this blind spot because the other eye can accommodate and one eyeball can kind of help sort of uh, prevent us from seeing that by moving around a lot. But there's ways we can trick our brain into seeing the optic disc by uh, through different optical illusions. Now the optic nerve is what extends beyond the eyeball, goes back towards the optic chiasm to the optic tract, and goes out to the rest of the brain. Now if we zoom in even further, on the retina, we see with the, with the neural part, there's many layers of cells here. Now, this part of the retina would be closer towards the vitreous humor in the posterior chamber, and this part of the retina would be closer towards the sclera, or the choroid of the, of the uh, eye. Now, deep in the retina, this is where we find our photoreceptor cells. In the photoreceptor cells here, we have rods and cones. Now, the rods here are involved with basically grayscale vision. Now these rods then are actually better at seeing things at night where you actually see it in grayscale. That differs from cones where we have different types of cone cells. These are involved in seeing color vision and these cone cells are better utilized in the daytime where we can see a sort of a wide variety of colors. Now with these other diff different layers in the retina, these bipolar cells or ganglion cells are involved in processing of that visual information and refining the information before it's sent out to your brain. If you all remember, we have the choroid layer back here, which has our blood vessels that are involved in nourishing the retina as well as cooling down the retina. And we have our pigmented layer of the retina, which has lots of melanocytes that help absorb light and keep light from scattering inside of our eyeball. Now, uh, remember, rods are involved with black and white vision or grayscale vision. Cones are involved with color vision. Now the bipolar and ganglion cells are basically involved with additional processing, but it's the ganglion cells that actually help transmit visual information out of the retina, out through the optic nerve, and towards the rest of the brain, because they're going to have the axons that um, extend out to the brain. Now earlier we mentioned how in the retina we have the optic disc, which is our blind spot, because there's all these blood vessels and nerves that prevent uh, basically any photoreceptors there in the retina. And so this part of our retina is essentially blind because it lacks photoreceptors. Now we can see this optic disc right here. And the reason why the optic disc appears to be more light in our picture of the retina is that there's a lot of uh, sort of reflection of light as it bounces off the retina here. 
and that way it appears more light. And you can see just near the optic disc, we have lots of blood vessels that extend out across the retina, as well as a very dark area here called the macula lutea. The macula lutea actually means yellow body, but it really just kind of appears to be sort of more uh, dark on the retina. And in the center of macula lutea, that's this even darker spot. This is the area of our retina where we have the sharpest vision. And it turns out that this part of our retina happens to be right in the center of our visual field. It's packed full of cone cells, which are for color vision. So what that means then is if you want to see something very sharply, you want to look at it right in the center of your visual field, and you're going to see colors even best right in the center of your visual field because the fovea centralis is chock full of our cone cells. Now, it has the highest proportion of cones and almost no rods, and has, it's the area of our sharpest vision. And uh, one thing that's important to note is that in order for light to be focused properly, our lens has to change shape and focus that light on our retina. And this is done by the action of the ciliary muscle found in the vascular tunic of our eye. Now, the ciliary muscle, which is basically smooth muscle, it has these things called suspensory ligaments that connect to the lens and it basically can help pull on the lens and help control the shape of the lens so that light is bent differently and focused appropriately on the retina. Now we can see that process illustrated here when we look at the difference between distant vision and uh, near vision. <clears throat> now if you look at the lens here for distant vision versus near vision, you can see that in both types of vision, whether you're looking at objects up close, I'm sorry, far away or up close, the shape of the lens is sort of different. You can see here that the lens is actually more elongated when you want to look at objects far away. That way when the light hits your lens, it's bent appropriately and focused right there on your retina. That way you can see it in focus. When you want to look at structures or things up close, uh, what happens is that um, the lens is a little bit more rounded so that that light can be bent and focused on your retina. Now, what ultimately changes the shape of the lens under both conditions are these ciliary muscles. And the ciliary muscles have to work especially hard with near vision because the lens has to be pulled sort of... Uh, you know, uh, laterally to um, change its shape and focus that light on the retina. <clears throat> Earlier we talked about how there's cavities in the eye. And we have anterior and posterior cavities. The anterior cavity is filled with aqueous humor and the posterior cavity is filled with vitreous humor. Aqueous humor is actually kind of more of a watery type of solution. Vitreous humor is more of a gelatinous type of solution located in the posterior cavity. And what this slide shows is just sort of a summary of how aqueous humor is formed. First, it's formed by these things called ciliary processes, which are in the ciliary body. And these ciliary processes, they form aqueous humor similarly to how cerebrospinal fluid is formed. So basically, it's filtered blood plasma that occurs in your capillaries. That filtered blood plasma enters the anterior cavity, where it can actually circulate to the anterior cavity, enter what's called the scleral venous sinus, and um, that's where it gets reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Now the purpose of actually making aqueous humor is to help nourish things like your iris and the cornea because the cornea is actually avascular, so it gets its nutrients from aqueous humor. Now it's constantly being made and absorbed so if there are issues with the rate of its secretion or the rate of its reabsorption, that can lead to deficiencies or excesses of aqueous humor. In, in pathophysiology, we'll talk about how if aqueous humor isn't absorbed fast enough, then that can lead to things like glaucoma, where you have too much aqueous humor building up in the anterior cavity. Now, the visual pathway uh, occurs when basically light enters the eyeball, goes through the lens, gets focused on the retina, that light activates photoreceptors found on rod and cone cells. It activates those cells which send action potentials to retinal ganglion cells. 
those retinal ganglion cells will send axons to the optic chiasm by way of the optic nerves. After the optic chiasm, we have the optic tract, which continues back towards the thalamus. And near the thalamus, we're going to have things like the lateral geniculate nucleus and the superior colliculi of your midbrain, which are involved in things like relaying sensory information to the occipital lobe or superior colliculi are involved in visual reflex. So to summarize this visual pathway, what happens is that we have axons that extend down the optic nerve, they go to the optic chiasm, that extends via the optic tract to the superior colliculi or the lateral geniculate nucleus. The superior colliculi are for unconscious visual reflex. The lateral geniculate nucleus is part of the thalamus where that information gets relayed towards the uh, primary visual cortex where we can become conscious of that visual information.